Good morning and thanks for joining Local Land Services to share knowledge of the Gawaita wetlands over a cup of tea this morning. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and made available on the Northwest Local Land Services website and a link to the recording will be emailed to you tomorrow. Today's webinar is supported by Local Land Services through funding from the Australian Government's Land Care Program. I'm Leonie Coleman, Land Services Officer with Natural Resource Management Team based here in Moree. Today you're in for a treat, sharing knowledge with two of our guests, presenters, Brad Mogridge, Rich and Dave Preston. Dave's here in the office with me and um, you can see Brad um, in Canberra. We're broadcasting today from Camilleroy country, which our first guest will acknowledge shortly. If you'd like to write in the chat on the right hand side of your screen what nation or town you're calling in from, that would be great. Our first guest, Associate Professor Bradley Mogridge, is a Camilleroy man who lives with his family in Canberra, where he's undertaking a PhD at the University of Canberra. Qualified in hydrology and environmental science, Brad has 25 years of water experience with the backing of the oldest culture on earth, which has inhabited the driest continent on earth for 65,000 years. That's a long history of peer-reviewed water science. Brad has worked with CSIRO and the Department of Primary Industries and is currently the Indigenous Liaison Officer for the Threatened Species Hub. In 2019, Brad was awarded ACT's Tall Poppy of the Year for Science and is a Fellow of the Peter Cullen Trust Science to Policy Leadership course. He's also a DAP hand at Gold. University of Canberra. And we're grateful that Brad has made time today to discuss his concept for a cultural calendar for the Gwaita wetlands. As a Camilleroy man, I'll hand over to Brad for welcome to country. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Lenny. Yeah, everyone. Yeah, look, I suppose I can only acknowledge because I'm on Ngunnawal country in Canberra. So I can, I, I can uh, if I was on Camilleroy country, I'd love to welcome you. Um, but yeah, look, um, thanks everyone for, for coming online. And obviously if people come on later and click in, click on to the recording later. Um, you know, acknowledge the country that everyone is on from, from their, their uh, computer camera. But um, look, yeah, I acknowledge country and um, can Leonie and Dave say good day to my country for me. I'm a long way away. Um, yeah, look, I might get on with it. Um, springing into summer. Um, yeah, it's, we had a warm weekend actually. Uh, we had some storms in, in Canberra and yeah, so I suppose we're starting to warm up. I keep an eye on Moree and places like that because we'll be up there in a couple of weeks. And, um, but yeah, obviously it's, it's warming up everywhere. And yeah, look, today I'm gonna have a yarn about Gwaita wetlands and cultural calendars is, is, is happening around the place. And, um, you know, it's happened a lot in Northern Australia. Um, there's sort of um, CSIRO and the Bureau, Bureau of Meteorology have done a fair bit of work with weather knowledge and, and also turning cultural knowledge into a, into a calendar and talk about season, seasons. Uh, I want to talk a bit about um, this project that I'm involved with, the, the LLS and obviously the, the Mungandai Land Council, um, and hopefully love to know that they're on or or they can watch the the, the um the recording later just to note look there'll be there'll be some photos of aboriginal people that have passed away in this presentation and um uh, just be wary of that and if you if you see that and uh you may want to switch your camera off if if it, if it if it does have an impact on you uh the next photo will have some other people that have passed away so um yeah look i'm camilla man from northwest new south wales and um, where the where the host is actually sitting on today, David and, and Leonie, and yeah, look, um, this is who I am, and you know, Mogridge is an old English name, 1032, Suffolk of England, and my, you know, through my mum there on the on the left, um, and obviously my grandmother, um, and you know, there's a um, she, we were lucky to have her for for 95 of her years, and um. And yeah, she, just yesterday actually, 
she would have been 102. So we lost her a few years ago, unfortunately, quite sadly for us. We just thought she'd be around forever. And she gave us a lot, passed on a lot of stories and, and language and people and places and her journey. And yeah, so we're, that's why I do what I do. And you know, that old, that old sepia photo is a picture of, from Wayland Station where a lot of her, you know, her father and grandparents are, are pictured in that. And so we're lucky to have photos like that. And then bottom right is, is my kids of also why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, they're at Boober Lagoon there. So Culture Bay of Water, um, I'll sort of talk a bit about why, we're, why I'm doing this. Um, you know, water is so important. As Leone mentioned, that we're on the driest inhabited continent on earth and we have one of the oldest living cultures on the planet. And, you know, I think we have a lot to offer. All this peer reviewed science and thousands of generations of observation of our country. I think we, we should have a say in when and where water flows, but also how it's managed. You know, when you think about water, it's in our songs, our dances, our dreaming stories and art, it's everywhere. And, you know, this traditional water knowledge, I like to get involved with, you know, how our how old people knew water, tell our stories our way, protect that water in the dry landscape, identify the value of water and then validate the knowledge. Um, and hopefully we can get to a point where we are at the table making decisions about water on country. These are just summer photos of my places. Um, you know, Boober Lagoon, that was the photo was taken on an old film camera in 2006 and scanned it in and stands the test of time. And Boober's looking a lot healthier there than it, than it was when I was there in uh, re as recently as 2018. So it was, um, you know, there's young eucalypt saplings growing on the on the foreshore below those old old trees that that form the bank. So the other one is obviously Gingham Waterhole. Um, that was in 2018, so it was looking pretty happy and healthy there. Uh, for people that aren't familiar with this place, you know, Google Maps show us where Guida wetlands are in in the context of New South Wales, um, up up closer to the Queensland border and and then there's a, there's a number of, of places within the wetlands complex. And you can see Munwonga, which is, um, which is what I'll be talking about today, but there's a lot of very important, you know, there's obviously um, Ramsar, Ramsar sites within the, the Gwaita complex. So, you know, internationally significant, we've got for a number of reasons, but also the cultural values um, we need to, to get more involved with. So the project, uh, we were engaged, um, it was a chance meeting Leone at um, Albury Wodonga, I think it was, at an NRM conference and um, we had a chat and where we're from, what we're doing and she she got excited and which, which was awesome. I'm glad she'd come up and said g'day and you know now we're looking at a, pro a project with um, the Mungandai Local Aboriginal Land Council um, and the, the process is looking at a cultural landscapes plan to hopefully improve the 83 hectare property, which Mungandai Lauk look after. And, you know, they are a major land landowner in the, in the wet, wetlands complex. So hopefully the, the aim of the, the project is understanding water knowledge for native flora. And it's the ones that especially that are water dependent, um, reduce weed infestation, that's a big challenge, and improve the habitat for the Australian bittern um, and other wetland birds. So there's a there's a process in there and um, I had engaged the services of a CSIRO uh, bird specialist and um, you know hopefully should be available to, to work with us. Um, just so the the project will mainly be engaging with Mungandai Local Aboriginal Land Council because they are the, the the owners of Munwonga. We've got ID to establish some protocols on, on country visits, determine a methodology, and then you know one of the outcomes could be the co-development of a Munwonga seasonal water calendar um, for engaging with and integrating Mungadai Lauk water knowledge. So that's the that's a possibility um, because the information that could be collected is is easily easily or what I believe is easily adaptable into a um, a seasonal water calendar. So ideally that, you know, that knowledge that determines indicators in the 
in, in the change with the seasons could potentially identify times for watering. That's the aim. And these are just some of the, the ones that CSIRO have been doing. This is the Daly River one in Northern Territory. And, um, you know, it has obviously um, for, for water stuff, there's some strong connections there. Um, and, you know, there's language which is strong in that. And I think there's an opportunity to put a lot of Kimilaroi and um, language in for the, for the Manwonga site, um, especially around species and, and obviously changes of seasons. These are just some photos. These are one of my photo points in the gingham. So you can sort of see it's doing, doing pretty tough. That tree was dead before the, obviously the drought, before it was dry. Um, but yeah, it's just my photo point that, you know, you, you add water and, you know, things come back to life. And this one, um, you can sort of see that, you know, behind that, that um, tree that sits in the, in the gingham, you can, you can see the kumbungi coming back to life. So the, the ideas behind the Manwonga well, season of calendar is communicating Indigenous knowledge and values. Um, so it's key knowledge that's stored in one place, highly engaging process, and appeals to a wider audience. Um, so, you know, there's it, the idea would be that it's Indigenous led and they're obviously co-developed with um, the knowledge knowledge holders and, and obviously the landowners as well. And Ideally, you want to do it within the, the water management context. So you've got the Water Management Act in New South Wales and the, the, um, the ECA, which, which looks after the, the guida wetlands from an environmental watering point of view. Um, and they're like an environmental watering advisory group. I think that the common term in, but um, the, the more in mob want to, want to stick with um, ECA OAC. And obviously, we're aiming for long-term deliverables um, for the project as well. These are just some photos recently um, sharing and connecting with, with um, the Guaida wetlands. So we're up recently and uh, my brother brought his drone up, which was cool. And so you, um, you know, the brother there, Jason on the top left, he's, um, he's uh, you know, talking to, to, to my family and, and sister-in-law and, and nieces and nephews and daughter and wife and just about his knowledge about the place and you know that that's what it's all about and then my, my son there standing in the in the gingham and um then obviously connecting with family so my uncle lloyd um from moray and, and his wife Annie edna and you know we got to we got to hang out with them for a night and have a yarn and you know his mum's eldest brother um so you know it's 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 a privilege to, to to talk and connect with our family um and share and then a bit of drone footage there of the the gingham, which is a, I think is a really cool photo. You can sort of see the extent of it. Um, and, you know, it's a decent size. We've got a bit of, I think that's red azola hanging out in the wetlands there. Um, and then bottom right, you can see my son connecting with Instagram. Um, he's just checking up his, his statuses and yeah. Some of the values that might pop up in, in identifying, you know, what's on country, you know, the creation sites, cultural creators, you know, linking the spiritual to dreaming tracks. And they link to, to, to specific places on country. Um, language, you know, which is a, an important part of who we are. Um, it connects the culture to place with water and also the seasons. So that could be a, a definite opportunity to connect language in our resource sites, you know, the bush foods and medicines when they're, when they're turning up, when the water's there, what's going to be there. Um, and then obviously then we move into the other resource sites, which is more around the, the artifacts, um, the tools and the arts and crafts and the aquatic reeds and, and, and grasses for, for weaving, which is obviously the next one is gender specific sites for, for men and women's business. And so obviously you know, the, the weaving is, is, is very strongly linked to, to women's stories and business. Ceremonial sites. No doubt there would have been some around these water holes because a lot of our big ceremonial sites um, were around water because when you've got big mobs of people together, you're gonna, always gonna need water and potentially, you know, who knows what we've lost in, in the wider wetlands. And that, that's another challenge is that we don't really know what we have because, you know, you've got to think about that potentially a lot of our mob have been locked out of, out of the wider wetlands for 150, 200 years. Um, and I suppose we're just reconnecting because a part of the property is coming back into public hands and, and obviously Mungandai Land Council has, has part of that, that comp, the wetlands complex as well, which is exciting. 
this is at the um, the bird hide at Benor, and you can sort of see it's it's doing it tough in April 2018, and we get some fresh water in in October 2018, and it just comes back to life. And obviously, to the left of there, there's a there's birds everywhere, um, so you can sort of see um, the difference water can make to, to country. Some specific, also groundwater are important, you know, the, the springs and the soaks and, you know, survival in a dry landscape. If there's no surface water, groundwater is going to be your only source. Um, there's a lot of sites that are groundwater sites that are women's sites in, in Camilla country. So, you know, me being a male, I need to be very careful. Obviously, trade was a big part of, of groundwater sites, you know, at, at spring sites, ceremony, and obviously teaching the stories and, and the dreamings and other. Um, you know, rainbow serpent occurs a lot in, in groundwater stories, and we have the Gadia in, in River Lagoon. So some of the envir environmental and cultural conditions for totemic species or cultural keystone species, you know, these are the species that are very important culturally, but also, you know, that they may be at the top of the food chain, like the, you know, the wedgetail eagle and, and species like that, or the brolga turning up to our wetlands and doing its dance at that time of year. and because there's water in the wetlands, it's at the right time, and the brogas are there doing their thing, and the mob are watching them. You know, that's that's obviously the a key part of that. So we've got the physical stuff, um, tangible evidence of, of of you know us being on country. You know, the middens, you know, the freshwater middens are getting rarer and rarer. Um, our campsites, scarred trees. You know, there's a beautiful big scarred tree. Um, in, in the wetlands, there's probably many more that we have to find. Um, carved trees, which which are very important in ceremony and also identifying certain places in the landscape. And you know, if those trees are still alive, they're still going to be water dependent. So we need to protect them as well. And then obviously we have the if there you know there were stone arrangements um, and tribal boundaries and, and future nail traps. So the seasonal indicators, I suppose, the important bit we need to think about here, and you know, indicators of health of, of country and water. You know, so like we saw that those photos of when times are dry in the wetlands, and you know, it is a wetting and drying um, history in our wetlands in the Australian in the Australian context. And you know, these these seasonal indicators are important. You know, that could be the turning up of a species or a, an insect or a um, the flowering of a certain plant. So obviously those sort of things um, have, have strong strong relations to what we can put into a, a, a calendar if, if that's if that's something possible we can do with the with a mung and no mob. And I suppose the other thing is that without this information, the cultural values are just lumped in with environmental values or not at all. Um, you know, an example is say like the I think the Northern Territory has an 80-20 rule. 80% 80, 80 is for the environment and 20% is the consumptive pool. And 80% of the environmental water that, that's that's left in the system is just assumed that it takes care of cultural values. And you know, that hasn't been tested um, to the full extent. You know, that's that's a lot the same with a lot of our environmental watering. They're they're very rarely informed by cultural knowledge. It's only in recent years that we've had advances in um, by our mob, you know, the um, Cultural flows research um, is is having a direct input to how we we consider country and some of those Aboriginal waterways assessments. I don't really like them to be honest, but um, the methodology isn't for all. Um, but that's why I'm sort of doing as part of my PhD a methodology that is written by me for my country. Um, um, so yeah, and some of these some of these indicators could be you know the the crayfish or crawbobs, as we used to call them, and you know, crawling out backwards of a waterhole, you know, the potential dissolved oxygen is 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 not there, and it's time for them to move. And you know, you see them from time to time, and obviously that water is not going to be good. Identify the timing of flows, and that's what you know, that, what can be determined as part of a seasonal calendar is, you know, if if a certain plant flowers, or as I mentioned, you know, the a species turns up. Um, but also within the um, in the environment as well, we're going to see translocated cultural species. You know, that's foods and medicines um, that are that appear in appear on country that have been moved there for a purpose. And you know, there's no doubt some examples of that in the wetlands. The physical health of aquatic species. 
So you know, fish will show stress when they're when they're stressed in in their in their water environment, and obviously certain species disappear as um, as these as the water becomes, um, yeah, as we saw at the end of end of 2019 with the fish kills in the Lower Darling. You know that that these deep water holes aren't surviving um, dry times and potentially over extraction is, is, is a key part of that. And obviously we've got climate change scenarios filling there, filling in there as well. The changing of the winds and as I said, you know, the arrival of a certain species and and also the other thing that does come into as part of part of this is is um, cultural burning as a, as a key part of landscape management. And you know that's something that may need to be explored in the complex as well. And then, yeah, the importance of certain species, whether that's cultural or a food source, um, they can be identified at certain times of the year. And that's me with all my water selfies. Thanks. I'll uh, hand you back over to Leonie. Yeah, thanks, Brad. That's um, fantastic insight into the project that you're you're running in conjunction with um, with us. Um, you know, it was a really good meeting that we had at uh, Wodonga last year. I was so glad that um, I uh, put myself out there and went and introduced myself and made myself known to you. I think um, it'll be a, a win for um, Mung Wonga and a win for the Mungandai um, owners of, of, um, of Mung Wonga as well. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, David Pre Preston's our next guest. Uh, David is Wetlands and Rivers Conservation Officer with the Biodiversity and Conservation Division of New South Wales Government, based here in Moree. Having worked with OEH for over five years in water programs, David has a background in aquatic ecology of both inland New South Wales and Queensland. David coordinates the annual environmental monitoring programs across the Northwest, um, and that includes the wider wetlands. David is pretty much the eyes and the ears on the ground reporting on water, fish, frogs, birds and vegetation. So thanks Dave for um, joining me in the office today. Um, so I'll hand over to you. Yeah, we'll just change presenters. And sorry, we've just fiddled our screens around a bit today. So. Yep, do you want to try that? Okay, everyone. Um, thanks, Leonie. So, my name is Ada Preston, as has been said. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of land where I am today, the Gomorrah community people, their elders past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge that it was and always will be Aboriginal land. So, locally, when we refer to the Gwada wetlands, we're talking about the wetlands, all the wetlands on the Gwada floodplain. Um, so, as Brad said, the Gwada is in northern New South Wales and it's part of the Murray Darling Basin. So, historically, the wetlands covered about 200,000 hectares. They could easily shrink and grow in response to flows that were coming in uh, without impacting farming operations. So over time, the total wetland area has reduced due to smaller and fewer flows reaching the wetlands uh, as a result of Coton Dam and uh, extraction for irrigation and an increase in cropping area. So this area reduction in the wetlands has continued until the early 2000s. At that time, the wetlands were a dry, dry landscape with infrequent sporadic flows and that promoted exotic plant species um, really being present and obvious in the, in the wetlands. So flooding in 2011-12, it filled water for the environment accounts in Coton Dam and since then we've been able to help restore and maintain part of the remaining approximately 20,000 hectares. So the focus of water for the environment that's been delivered to the wetlands uh, has been to restore and maintain the three largest remnant wetland areas. So the, the Gingham, the, Gingham, the Lower Gwaita and Malawa wetland areas. So this restoration and maintenance has been with state and Commonwealth water for the environment 
and the support of the Guada Environmental Water Advisory Group. So they were formally established in the late 90s and it's made up of local people and groups including Aboriginal representatives, government departments, environmental representatives, landholders and indicators. There's something about the Guada, it's, it's important. It's somewhere where you can see heaps of different species all in one place. So all of the species that you see here, none of them that I know of are unique to the Guada, but it's one place you can see all of them together in one area. So during floods, birds can come in tens of thousands per species to breed. Um, and there are, in the past, there's reports of hundreds of thousands of species coming together to breed in colonies and make use of abundant food resources. So Guada wetlands are known to support 75 species of water birds with at least 50 of those breeding. This includes straw-necked ivis, uh, which are the two images at the bottom there. Uh, egrets, herons, heaps of dark species, all sorts of birds. Uh, this year I spotted a black neck stalk juvenile, which is the image in the top left. Um, and we're, we're fairly sure it was hatched in the gingham wetlands. So vegetation, we've, we've got a couple of different species, uh, threatened ecological plant communities. This includes the largest stand of marsh clubbrush in the state. It's in the background of the image in the top right. So just over 12 months ago, there was a fire in the, that burnt the core gingham wetlands. This had an unknown cause and it burnt 1,300 hectares. Just after the fire in uh, summer last year, the area was burnt. Sorry, the, the burnt area just had black earth and ash. There's not really anything left. A couple of um, dead trees, but it was pretty bare. And now, following several flows and some rainfall events out there, you can't really tell on the surface that it's been burnt. So currently there's minimal surface water present, having dried back to small water holes and lagoons from good rain and natural flows earlier this year. The plant community has had a chance to reset following the drought. It's now what we call event ready, meaning that there's, if there's a very large natural flow event which triggers bird breeding, the habitat that they need is there waiting or ready to grow with the flood. Many plants that are there now, they're setting seed or after flowering, while others are preparing to go dormant for dry weather. There's several birds still present now. Uh, one of those is Latham snipe. It's a small migratory wader, which visit Japan and other Northern Hemisphere countries over our winter. Um, so that, I guess that's what it's looking like now. And when I was first asked to, to talk to you today, has to give a bit of a current condition state and that's what it's looking like now but I think it's important to have a bit of context and background to know what that current state means. And yeah, I hope, hope I've given that in the short time today. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So I guess it's all ready, David, just waiting for water, yeah. waiting for a, a decent inundation. Yeah. So an extended period of inundation is what, what we're really after. Yeah, and if we don't get that, it's it's uh you know dry it can go dry and wait until that comes if it's later this year or next summer. So the inundation it can dry. the inundation we saw in those rains over late summer and autumn um, that was a, a relatively small event. Yeah. yeah yeah so it was pretty small it wet a really good area um, and most of, most of the core wetlands were inundated. Um, but yeah it's definitely event. And that the, the extent of inundation was that was that a ideal to set everything up or? Do you yeah, I think it was pretty. It was pretty good area inundation. There's there's some parts that could have done with a longer duration, so um, some of their life cycles could could be completed. But the the core area they were really inundated for a good amount of time. Yeah, good. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, um. I'd like to thank both of our guests, Brad and David, for today. Uh, it's been a really good insight, I think, into um, cultural values that we're looking to engage with in the in the Guaida. 
as well as um, your background shows that you've given. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, there'll be a short uh, um, survey at the end of the webinar. It'd be great just to get feedback so we can improve our webinars um, going forward. Um, and as mentioned, you'll also receive a recording of this, um, of this webinar. So thanks everyone for joining us today and um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, it's fine. I've ended it. <laughs>